Hello friends, welcome back to your class on Old Testament Prophets. In the previous two lectures, we briefly looked at the structure of the Jewish canon, the office of a prophet and the historical background of the prophets and their books. Today, we will learn about Prophet Amos and his prophetical book. Let us begin. Prophet Amos was also called the preacher of holiness. He was the first among the writing prophets of the 8th century. The Assyrian kingdom was rising and speedily becoming a world power with new and powerful kings taking up the throne. This was the time when Israel was very powerful and could not be easily challenged by the other nations. Though it was a time of peace and prosperity in Israel and Judah, but the internal gap between the rich and the poor, the noble and the simple was widening. The rich and the noble were becoming wealthier by exploiting the poor and the simple. Thus, Prophet Amos warned the people of Israel of the injustice and false worship and the impending judgment. As mentioned in the previous lecture, the message of the prophets of this period had three strands social sins, political sins and religious sins. Prophet Amos was the first among the classical prophets whose words have been recorded. His hometown, hometown was in Tekoa, which is nearly 12 miles south of Jerusalem on the edge of the Judean desert. He was prophesying during the kings Uzziah in Judah and Jeroboam in Israel. His book can be placed around 755 BC. His place of ministry was Israel. As he prophesied in Bethel, he was challenged by Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, who said, Get out, you seer, go back to the land of Judah, earn your bread from there and do your prophesying there. Do not prophesy any more in Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. To this Amos replied, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son. I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord who took me, it was the Lord who took me from the tending of the flock and said to me, Go and prophesy to my people Israel. So we see that he was a layman from south and had two occupations as a shepherd or herdsman and as a farmer, a dresser of sycamore fig trees, the latter being seasonal. He had gone to Bethel to sell his agricultural produce when God called him to be a prophet. He refused to be known as a prophet or a seer because of the bad reputation of the prophets carried at that time, especially the false professional prophets around the shrines of Bethel. Many commentators are of the view that when he went to Bethel to sell the agricultural produce, God called him and he received his five visions and as an experience of his call which is mentioned in chapters 7 to 9. The genuine mark of a prophet as mentioned in the previous uh, chapters are clearly seen in the call of Amos. He had an excellent understanding of holiness and justice. He could easily comprehend God's hand in the course of history of the nations. He easily could see the stark difference between the conditions of northern kingdom under the evil king Jeroboam and the southern kingdom under the godly king Uzziah. Let us now look into the historical background. Jeroboam I, who started as a reformer against oppression during the last part of Solomon's reign, gradually became the cause of religion, corruption, religious corruption in Israel by setting up golden calves as symbols of Yahweh at Bethel and Dan. He combined the pagan religious worship and Yahweh's worship and led the people into sin of idolatry which continued for generations. Let us look into the divisions of the book. The book can be divided into eight parts considering the oracles against Israel and surrounding nations and the five symbolic visions. The first division is oracles against nations which is found in Amos chapter 1 verse 3 to chapter 2 verse 16. 
The second is oracles against Israel which is in Amos chapter 3 verse 1 to Amos chapter 6 verse 14. The third are the three visions which is found in chapter 7 verse 9. The fourth is the encounter with Amaziah which can be seen in chapter 7 verse 8 to 17. The next is the, four, the fourth vision which is found in chapter 8 verse 1 to 3. Then we have the four oracles which is mentioned in chapter 8 verse 4 to 8, 14. Then we have the fifth vision which is mentioned in chapter 9 verse 1. Lastly, we can see the theology of creation and redemption which is mentioned in chapter 9 verses 2 to 25. Now let us look into the message of Amos. The five visions of Amos. These five visions of Amos were a part of his call as well as his message. Each of these stand for God's judgment over Israel. Amos chapter 7 verses 1 to 3 talks about the judgment by the locust. Chapter 7 verses 4 to 6 talk about judgment by fire. Chapter 7 verses 7 to 9 talk about a plumb line. Chapter 8 verses 1 to 3 talk about a basket of summer fruits. And chapter 9 verses 1 to 4 talk about the Lord standing by the altar. The first two visions, both the first two visions of judgment by locust and fire speak about complete destruction. It was impossible to survive or escape them. The first is a natural calamity and the second is a supernatural disaster as a divine act of God. Amos intercedes for Jacob and God relents his mercy. He later says, neither, will, neither of this will happen. There will be no complete destruction. The third vision, as we see, Amos sees God holding a plumb line against a wall. God told Amos that he is setting a plumb line among the people of Israel and they cannot escape his judgment. This meant that following the sins of Jeroboam, the whole Israel has completely failed in her spiritual worship. Hence, all the high places, sanctuaries and Jeroboam's house will be destroyed. The fourth vision was a basket full of summer fruit. It was a very familiar sight for Amos in regard with offerings brought in for the festival of booths. But here the vision had a different meaning. It meant that Israel was ripe with sin for a dreadful harvest. The fifth vision of the Lord standing by the altar was a very different vision. Amos saw the Lord is standing at the altar and it looks like a veil is being drawn away uncovering the future where he sees the coming of destruction and it is God himself who is bringing it. Now let us move to the eight oracles. In chapters 1 to 2, 1 and 2, Amos proclaims eight oracles of judgment against neighboring nations and Israel. God is shown as a roaring lion calling out destruction upon nations. The nations that are mentioned are Syria and Damascus, Philistine and Gaza, Tyre, Edom, the Ammonites, the Moabites, Judah and lastly Israel. The main focus of judgment was Israel due to their religious sins of idol worship and apostasy and their social sins of injustice, oppression, exploitation, bribery, idleness, drunkenness, gluttony, etc. Now let us look at his message on the day of the Lord. This is a very common theme in the Israelite teachings. They desired to see everything made right on earth. They expected that one day Yahweh would come and set everything right. His coming was called the day of the Lord. Amos gave a new understanding to the day of the Lord. According to him, it would be a day of darkness or judgment rather than the day of light or bliss as was the common understanding. He turned the whole concept upside down. This interpretation falls very much in line with the message of Amos 
which talks about the terrible judgment that was to come upon Israel. The immediate future, according to Amos, was that of war, captivity and exile. Judgment was sure to come. Now let us move to the hope of the future that Amos talks about. Amos in his oracles spoke about only the judgment for Israel with no hope. But in his writing towards the end, he added five lines about the hope of Israel in the distant future, which is mentioned in chapter 9 verses 11 to 15. Probably he did not believe that Yahweh will destroy Israel completely. Amos uses poetical language to express the time of blessings and connects it with the house of David. This age is the messianic age because Messiah would reign. His reign would be characterized by prosperity because of the justice and the righteousness of Messiah. Amos chapter 9 verses 11 to 15 can be divided into two parts. Verses 11 and 12, the main theme is king and his kingdom. Verses 13 to 15, the main theme is life of liberty of the citizens within the kingdom. Now let us look into the theology of Amos. Firstly, Amos sees Yahweh as the creator and the controller of everything. Amos was not a reformer, but he was a Jew who grew up learning Torah, believing Yahweh to be the creator of everything. In chapter 4 verse 12 to 13, we read that Amos points out towards the mighty powers of God and warns the Israelites saying that his power still prevails and always will. It is not only limited to the past. He controls the events of the world and the disasters brought by nature. His first two visions talk about complete destruction by the locusts and fire. The second view of God by Amos was that Yahweh is the judge of all nations. This is seen in the eight oracles spoken by Amos. Judgment concerns not only Israel and Judah, but all the other nations also. He is the one and omnipotent ruler. The rise and the fall of nations is dependent upon him. Hence, his ethics, righteousness and justice should be followed by all the nations. The third is Israel shares a personal relationship with Yahweh as his chosen people. Israel is God's chosen possession, his elected people, privileged by God. Hence, they hold an equally important responsibility greater than the other nations. God had revealed his character and his purpose to them in much vivid manner. The Israelites were happy to accept the privileges but not the responsibilities that came along. Thus, they will be judged even if they do not believe it. Amos severely criticized them for imitating Canaanite practices. This is all on the book of Amos. We will soon meet in the next class with the prophetic book of Hosea. Bye for now.